Hello, this is Josh Lewis. Today I'm interviewing Scott Yeoman. It's August 17th. We're in Washington, D.C. at his home. This interview is part of the D.C. Gardener's Oral History Project and is sponsored by the Neighborhood Farm Initiative and the D.C. Humanities Council. And we'd just like to thank Scott for being here with us today. And so could you just start by sharing your name and address with us, Scott? My uh, name is Scott Yeomans, uh, Washington, D.C., um, on Sedgwick, Sedgwick Street, 3041 Sedgwick Street, across from the Melvin Hazen Garden. Thank you. So let's start uh, from the beginning. What, where were you born? California. I grew up in Southern California. All right. And uh, how was that? How long did you live in California? I lived in California for about 30 years before I moved to Washington and uh, have been here 16 years now in Washington, okay. yeah. So, uh, growing up, um, you know, what kind of things do you remember from California that, that really st stand out as memories? I mean, is it that was... Well, I grew up um, in Ventura County, which is near Santa Barbara, Ventura, Oxnard area. So it's outside of Los Angeles, about an hour and a half on the beach. So, I mean, the biggest part of my growing up was the beach mm -hmm. and a lot of outdoors activity. Um, it is, was a tourist area, so the beach was a big part of what everybody did. Um, and as far as gardening goes, you know, the home that I grew up in early on, uh, we had a backyard with a garden. And so there was quite a bit of that hands-on gardening done from an early age. Later on, when we moved, we didn't have a house that had that ability to, to do vegetable gardening, but there were um, fruit trees and flower beds and things like that to take care of. So I did a little bit of that extension during my growing up time. And then when I came here, um, I've been gardening in Melvin Hazen for about 10 years. Okay. So... But so how, what do you remember about the, the first garden, vegetable garden? How big was it? Well, it was pretty much a big chunk of the backyard. Mm -hmm. Ripped up the grass. We had vegetable, I'm sorry, we had uh, fruit trees growing up. So we had like apricots and we had guava and um, gosh, there was probably an orange or a lemon or something like that, citrus wise. Um, the garden took up about a quarter of the backyard. We just ripped up the grass <coughs> in the backyard area and basically gardened at leisure throughout whatever season. In California, it's pretty easy to do almost year-round. Um, where I grew up, there's no snow or winter, per se. It gets cooler, but it doesn't get cold. So um, we could pretty much do what we needed to, what we wanted to year-round. Um, but it's kind of like a childhood project, so I just did it because I could, and we had this space. Um, some years better than others, and you know, when you're smaller or younger, you know, you don't know too much, so things don't grow as well, or you don't take care of it quite the way you would as you're an adult. As an adult, but I remember still the space that we had in the backyard and ripping up the grass and planting things. I can't say it was super successful. It was more like a hobby, um, but like I said, we had other things like fruit trees and stuff that were basically took care of themselves and they produced very well. So it was, it was nice to see that happening because you kind of had a sense of what gardening was all about. But I also grew up in an area that was very, very agricultural. So aside from my own personal gardening experience, um, there was agriculture all around us. There were strawberry fields, there were citrus groves, um, avocados, nuts, all kinds of trees like that. Um, the area that I grew up in was considered very agriculturally fertile, so there were lots and lots of vegetable producers in the area. So you, you know, and just driving around you would see fields and fields and fields of various different things growing. So vegetable gardening per se wasn't very foreign to me you know it was all around me as far as a, an industry goes and then just kind of dibbled and dabbled at home with stuff so 
what what was it like? Uh, I mean, with all those um, producers growing food, I mean, were there markets and little vendors all over the place? Or? Surprisingly, not. No, it was all commercial, and it was packaged and shipped out. So we didn't have really like farmers markets like that concept wasn't really common growing up. You went to the grocery store, that was where things were. Um, because everything that was produced there was pretty much packaged and shipped. Yeah. We just saw the beginning of it, we never saw the end of it. Aside from strawberries, I think strawberries would be the only thing because you could actually go to the, grow, uh, to the fields and, and purchase from the fields. The strawberries were a big deal. So, so uh do you, you guys, sounds like you grew a good amount of the food that you, that you ate at your house, or was it? It was more experimental. I can't say we lived on it. <laughs> were your, were your parents into it, or was it just? No, it's just me. Oh, it's just okay, me. I see. Yeah, it was just me, just a backyard garden, kind of in a track home, you know, nothing big. It was more just for fun. Um, I always liked it. But it wasn't something that we lived off of. Did basically. you have siblings that helped you? Or? I have a younger brother, but he wasn't he wasn't around when that was going on. He okay. came much later. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I mean, yeah. most people as kids don't just <laughs> decide that they want to go and start growing vegetables. Well, true. It it was kind of a hobby, and like I say, I did it because I could because we had the space. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of fun to do. Uh, like I say, not huge success, but. It gave me the idea to, to try it later, so. Yeah. Okay. So, um, for the whole 30 years uh, that you lived in California, um, did you, when did you uh, leave California? I left in 1995. 95. Yeah, 1995, right, so I've been here ever since. Okay, and you just you came straight to the East Coast. What, mm -hmm. what brought you over here? I um, worked for a company that was headquartered in Arlington, mm -hmm. and the job that I had was expiring. And in order to stay with the company, um, they would move me to wherever I was able to get a job with the company, and I was able to get a job here in Washington. So I moved with the company because uh, there were no job opportunities with that company in my area after the job expired. So in order to stay with the company, I was able to get a job here, and then they moved me here. So, so you moved to the district but lived in Arlington? No, I moved to D.C., worked in D.C., and lived in D.C. Oh, okay. Um, the company was headquartered in Arlington, gotcha. but the job itself was at the Department of Commerce. What neighborhood did you move to? I started out in DuPont Circle. Mm -hmm. um, right off Florida and Massachusetts, that corner. Um, so South DuPont Circle, and then I worked downtown, so it was you know, really about practicality and being able to get around on the metro and stuff. Sold my car, got rid of all that stuff when I moved here, so um, had to make things pretty practical. And then I moved up here to Cleveland Park about, so it'll be 13 years, just over 13 years now. Okay. So, so 2000 to move to Cleveland Park. What what so what were some of the immediate things that stood out to you from you know West Coast to East Coast? I mean, have well, you been here before visiting? Or? I had been back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, part of my family lives in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and I spent a year there living. Um, went back to California. Uh, went back to Massachusetts and then went back to California. And then when I moved here, I had worked here for about mm, three, four months or so. Um, went back to California, then everything changed with the job situation when the contract ended. And then I moved back here um, permanently with the company. So I did a little back and forth. I had a, uh, you know, some exposure to East Coast in Massachusetts before coming here. Um, but I had never been here except for a couple of months when I worked uh, at the Commerce Department for a short stay before I went back to California. So coming here from California was a big move because it was very permanent. Um, however, the adjustment wasn't really that difficult. I had already been exposed to kind of what it was like here, so it wasn't wasn't too bad. Do you remember some of the things that we were like, well, like, man, I really like this, but it's not in... in California or you know the beach would be the biggest thing yeah not being close to the water would be the biggest yeah. thing because you know here 
it's a drive. You, I could walk. Yeah, do you before. prefer the whole no car thing or do you? I do, mm-hmm. yeah. And I, um, you know, I was carless here until about two years ago. So um, I don't miss driving at all, no, not one bit. Driving here is awful, so <laughs> I don't miss driving at, at, at all. So. so when you moved to Fort DuPont, right? DuPont Circle. DuPont Circle. Yeah. DuPont Circle. What I mean, this. What was the neighborhood like? Is it, I mean, was it? Mm, well, it was. I didn't really hang out in the neighborhood mm-hmm. per se. I mean, it was. I had a, a studio apartment, mm-hmm. and it was the apartment and work. Yeah. And then I found a church and. The neighborhood was, I think, it's not like it is now. Um, there was no huge farmer's market, number one. And there was, um, the neighborhoods are still about the same. But um, there wasn't anything uh, different about it than really it is now. It's still quite busy and uh, cosmopolitan, a lot of restaurants, stuff like that. Um, do you did you do um, any of your grocery shopping in that area, or what did you well, what did you like to do farmers market? Strangely, or? no. When I moved here, I really had a very little sense of where things were. So um, the first time I lived here, for the first couple of months that I lived here, I was in Woodley Park, and the only places that I knew were close to where I lived in Woodley Park, and and Crystal City. I thought Crystal City was Washington, D.C. I really didn't know geographically how things were laid out. So I went to the grocery store, and I only went to the grocery stores I knew, which were in Woodley Park and Crystal City. Mm. So strangely, until I figured out where everything was, um, getting to grocery stores was just going to where I knew. Farmer's markets weren't an option then. I mean, back... I mean, seriously, back 16 years ago, I mean, that was not something that was very common, at least in the city center, like the big one that they have on Sundays now, that, that didn't exist. So it was pretty much just grocery stores and what I knew. So it was normal grocery stores, a giant Safeway, whatever. Nothing, un- nothing unusual when, when it came to that. So, yeah. so when, you, when you got here, were you already kind of looking for some place to, to grow stuff, or was that really on it? Okay. No. Um, the interest came really just a little bit later after I moved here. Um, I knew there were community gardens around, but I didn't quite know how this all worked. The one, the Melvin Hazen one, where I am now, is, um, or was, at the time, just kind of like, oh, what's this? Because looking at apartments in this area, I noticed the garden, just basically read the kiosk out in the garden about it, and that's basically how I kind of found out and then pursued it from there. And then just kind of became aware that there were other ones around and stuff like that. However, this one was the first one that I really had any exposure to, so. So, um, you, didn't, you didn't really find out or search for community guards until you moved to this neighborhood? Right, mm-hmm. and, and I really didn't think about the concept. I mean, it wasn't something I was striving to, to to find or work with or anything like that. It just kind of happened, and it just sounded like a good idea. What so. year, approximately? Well, moved to this neighborhood in 2000 and was put uh, on the waiting list for Melvin Hazen a couple years prior to that. I was on the waiting list for four or five years before wow. I got a space there. So I knew about it just because you know, had seen it when we were looking for apartments in this general area, got put on the waiting list, and ironically, when I cleared the waiting list is when we moved into this complex, so. Okay, and, I mean, this is right around the corner. You really couldn't have got much closer. Oh, it's across the street. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it worked out really well, and it actually, it's just as well it happened when it did because it would have been a little more difficult to manage it if I had to commute to get to it so yeah, yeah. especially at that time having no car um, it's a lot to take care of and even walking across the street to take care of it is a challenge sometimes just because yeah you're subject to the weather you're subject to whatever 
Uh, so it worked out really well in my case, yeah. So, so when you, you, you get your plot, I mean, it's been several years really since you, mm -hmm. so what, what, what was it, what were you thinking, what, what state was the plot in, do you remember, was it? When I first got it, um, I mean, it wasn't bad, um, but it wasn't like manicured or perfect, ready to start. I had to do some cleanup, um, nothing major, but I had to do some cleaning up, get rid of some weeds, basically scrape it clean and start fresh. It wasn't bad. Um, I was really fortunate because being on a waiting list for so long and then getting the plot, I ended up with one that was in a good location, full sun, and a decent size because mine is 10 by 17 approximately, so it's about a size of a good bedroom. It's a lot to take care of, but it was in decent shape. I don't know how long it had been um, you know, left before I got it. However. Because of the cycle here, best I can gather is probably just over the winter, you know, because the season ends around November and then you pick up again in May. So it looked like a normal wintering over kind of situation. It wasn't bad. It's not like it had been abandoned for years or something like that. So, so, just, so are you pretty confident going in? I mean, did you know what you wanted to plant? Did you mm -hmm. have a, yeah. yeah, I thought so. Uh, once I cleaned it up, I kind of had a sense of what I wanted to do. Um, so that wasn't really a, much of a mystery. It was just a matter of cleaning it up, getting started, and seeing how it went. Um, the garden's organic, and it's run by the Park Service, so you have to follow the Park Service rules and um, follow the inspection schedule that the garden has set up. So as long as you, you know, stayed within those guidelines, um, yeah, I kind of knew what I wanted to do. Nothing outlandish, nothing, you know, too, too uh, exotic, normal stuff, tomatoes, beans, um, squash, simple stuff. So I figured I could fill it up really easily and with stuff that I could take care of. Years, as years went by, then I started, you know, venturing out with some other things to see what to do. But yeah, I pretty much knew what I could do. Yeah. Was was the uh, you mentioned the National Park Service uh, and one of the rules is that it has to be organic. There mm -hmm. was that something you were uh, accustomed to already, or well, just by just by nature for myself, it's something that I always would have maintained anyways. So um, adhering to the rules wasn't a problem. Um, I wasn't inclined to go any other route anyways. So I probably would have done that even if it wasn't the rule, but. Um, they don't permit um, pesticides, herbicides. Um, I don't use anything on mine. I don't use fertilizer either. It's all natural. And so I didn't have any problem with it. So, and I wasn't planning to go um, investing in pesticides and herbicides anyway. So <laughs> it was going to be whatever happens, happens. So um, actually, um, the guidelines are pretty straightforward. The biggest things that they have um, set up are just making sure that you weed properly, harvest properly, um, and maintain your plot and keep it organic. So it's not too not too strict. It's pretty basic. But. So um, where where did you get like your seeds or seedlings? You know, in the, in the first few years, did you have a just, consistent spot? Or? I used to go. Well, still do. Um, Johnson's which is the local nursery up the street. American Plant Food is another one. Um, those are my two primary sources of getting seeds and plants. Um, I tried mail order a little bit later on. I found that to be more expensive than necessary, a little too cumbersome. I didn't like all the packaging. And then, you know, you had to plan a little bit differently because you had to allow for shipping time and they only had certain things available at certain times then when you got them it may be too early and you couldn't put them in the ground so what do you do with them especially when you're in an apartment there's no place to put any of that kind of thing you can't put them in your garage or uh, keep them under some kind of fluorescent lights or whatever they needed whatever so you had to order things just right so you got them when you could plant them and hope that the weather was permitting and, and whatever else so I pretty much just stuck to the local nurseries. Was there anything that you wanted to plant that you know that you remember from back in California that you were just kind of bummed out when wouldn't really work here? Or? 
No, not particularly. Um, there are certain things that are a little more labor intensive that I wouldn't say were memorable things, but things that I would have liked to have done here that I just couldn't, couldn't make work, like strawberries for one. I could never get mine to go. Other people in the other plots, no problem. I just couldn't get mine to work. Um, you're not allowed to do corn or tall things that will shade out other plots, corn being one of them. Corn would have been fun to do, um, but it's just not one of those things that works if you have neighbors and you are at risk of shading them out because of the sun or whatever. Um, but no, there wasn't anything particular that I wanted to try that I couldn't try for whatever reason. Just I just worked with what I knew I could manage. So, so when you got there around 2000, uh, were there any uh, older or more experienced gardeners that you might have gotten advice from or maybe just always kept an eye on their plot to see what they were doing? Or? Well, there are a lot of people there that I knew had been for a while and they're still there. So people that I know, a lot of people that are around me are the original gardeners from when I started. So I knew they had to been there before me. Um, I always found the people that I was around to be more than helpful with information Everyone shared, still do, you know, share. You know, if you've got an overabundance of something, to help yourself, whatever. Um, so, like, I'm in a situation right now where I have no kitchen. The kitchen's being fixed. So all the stuff that I've been growing this year I can't use. So I've been giving it away at work or offering it to people around me, stuff like that. And that's pretty common around um, with help and with produce. So... Um, We have two meetings a year with the garden, and that's where you really get more of the insight from the experienced gardeners, because they will share at that point. Because half the time you're out there, there's one or two people out there. You know, you never know who you're going to meet. So it's really kind of hard um, to engage in a conversation. But I've heard many people talk to each other about, you know, what do I do with this? I've never seen this. I've got this bug. What do I do with that kind of thing? Um, so there's a lot of experience out there, um, and people are more than happy to, to share. And I've been asked, I'm no expert, but I've been asked, you know, how did you get that to grow? Or I've been, I've been trying to get that to grow for years, I can't get, how did you get it? It's like, you know, there's no trick, it just either works or it doesn't work. So. <laughs> but it's kind of interesting because some people can grow stuff just fine, and other people try the same exact thing and it doesn't work for them. So I don't know. The soil shouldn't be that different, but it could be very different from plot to plot to plot, depending on what you've done or not done. So depending on the balance of the soil, certain things will work from one spot to the next. Um, even if it's the same shade and sun and whatever, it's just a little bit um, trial and error to see uh, what will work. But it's a lot of experience, a lot of helpful people. So, What, what types of techniques have you tried uh, for soil you know, amendments or improvements? The only thing I do is basically green, what they call green gardening, which is I dig back in what's appropriate back into the soil. You don't want to put stuff that's diseased back in. So when you eliminate that element, basically anything that's grown in there goes back in there and it just gets plowed under and decomposes and becomes dirt again. So I don't use any fertilizers or amendments. I tried early on getting stuff um, there's a couple products out there that you can get at the nursery to enhance the soil and stuff like that but I didn't find them to do any good or harm so there was no point in it so I just stopped um, so I just rely on the green garden concept which is just to plow things back in let the ground take care of itself and rotating crops that's a big deal. I mean, it's kind of a standard thing to make sure that you're rotating stuff because one crop could deplete certain nutrients from that area, so moving them to another area will ensure, or more or less ensure their success than planting them in the same place year after year after year. Um, so over the last, I mean, just under 15 years you've been there, have, have you noticed any type of like demographic changes in who's gardening, I mean age wise or I mean families or single people or not really. The mix has always been pretty bold. So there's been a mixture of families, kids, 
older people, single people, there hasn't really been a shift that I've seen. It's pretty consistent. The turnover in the garden, at least in this garden, is relatively small. There's over 200 people on the wait list right now, from what I understand, and the turnover is not very rapid. So the few gardens that do turn over, you don't notice new people that often simply because there's not a big turnover out there. That particular garden, I don't know why, but the waiting list is pretty long and you're pretty much guaranteed of a five-year wait once you get on it. So, so noticing a change in the demographics is limited because it doesn't change very often. Seems so. Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> How uh, how have you noticed that the relationship and interaction between you know the rest? I know you're part of the neighborhood, but the rest mm -hmm. of the community and neighborhood and Melvin Hazen. Do people stop and ask questions? Do mm -hmm. people? I mean, yeah. have you ever had people? You know, theft or uh, I don't know. Uh, well, fortunately, not theft. Um, there's very little that seems to go on in that respect. Um, I mean, it's kind of interesting because the garden is pretty right there. You know, there's nothing to keep anybody in it or out of it. Um, the years that I've been with it, it's been pretty consistent as far as um, safety and people's plots. You hear about the random stuff like, you know, I had this or that out there and the next day it was gone. You know, where did it go? It could have been anything from a deer or a squirrel or a bird or a person. You never know. Um, but there's really been nothing that's changed that I've noticed you know, drastically over the years that I've been in the garden. Uh, it's been pretty consistent all along. The biggest thing that we've dealt with as a garden community has been um, the deer. That's been our biggest challenge, and rabbits. So keeping the deer in their area and the rabbits in their area. So you're you, like that garden, and I don't know if this is true for all of them, but for ours, what we did was we would put up a deer net. So there's a higher net around the chain link fence to prevent them from jumping in. And um, there's no way to prevent the rabbits and other things from digging under the fence and coming in from Rock Creek Park. So it's just nature. You know, it's not a whole lot you can do with it. You just got to hope that whatever you put out there is going to survive until it's mature enough. Um, a lot of people take their own measures. They build little fences around or they cage things in or they drape things up because um, it's kind of a shame to go all season and you're waiting for this one particular something to become ready and then overnight something comes and takes a bite out of it or something. So um, people do various things just to try to protect what they're growing or they just leave it to chance. I don't generally take any special precautions. Um, it's a lot to manage, it's a lot to maintain. The only thing I did was with blueberries. I planted some blueberry bushes and they produced, but the blueberries were eaten the minute they show up. So one year, I only had them for two years. The second year is I draped them and I got one blueberry. So <laughs> there are no more blueberries, <laughs> needless to say. They took up a lot of space for a lot of effort, and it wasn't worth it for one blueberry. So, Is there anything else that you just, you just don't grow anymore just because it's... Um, <clears throat> tomatoes right now. I kind of had my fill of it. They, they're kind of 50-50. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Like this year, I think it would have been kind of disastrous because we had so much rain. And then it got really, really hot, and that just causes them to swell and to break, and you know then they're wor you know they're worthless at that point. So tomatoes, I kind of gave up on. Um, I tried a little bit of corn once, uh, didn't didn't go, um, so I gave up on that. Uh, I've also given up on certain things that they've suggested that we stop. Like every once in a while, they'll ask us not to plant a certain type of something to eradicate a pest that's kind of prolific. So ooh, I think one or even two years straight, we had to stop doing like beans because there was a beetle that was prevalent. And in order to get rid of the beetle, we had to get rid of the plant. So um, there have been reasons to stop growing for other reasons. Did that work? It seemed to, because yeah, then we were able to do beans again. 
other than tomatoes, really, that's the only thing I've really kind of given up on. It just got kind of old after a while. Um, but I'm fortunate because the plot's big enough that I can kind of mix and match stuff. It's kind of hard to fill it up when it's that big. So um, putting you know, a variety of stuff in and allowing for it to grow, you've got to leave some blank space, but then you look over and you still got another quarter of it. Like last year, I didn't even plant one quarter of it. I kind of rotated around and kept a quarter open because I just couldn't think of enough things to put out there. Um, to fill the whole thing up. So tomatoes be the only thing I probably kind of stopped. Squash kind of goes one year in, one year out because A, you get a little tired of it, but B, it takes up a lot of space. And yeah, that's probably it. Yeah. I've been pretty consistent with everything else that, I, that I've done. Lettuce, cabbage for some reason I have good luck with, other people not. Some people it works, some people it doesn't. Um, radishes, beets, um, I don't bother with carrots, they don't seem to do very well for me. Parsnips, I tried, they didn't do very well either. Um, good luck with herbs. Um, beans have always done well, squash has always done well. Melons have always done well, if you can catch them before they get eaten. Cucumbers have always done well. Uh, lettuce, um, any type of greens, kale, mustard, collard, anything like that has always tends to do pretty well. Um, Swiss chard does really well. Um, broccoli, cauliflower does really well. But even when you plant all that, you still got a quarter left. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of hard to keep it all filled in. So do you mostly plant it from seeds or do you get seedlings or how do you? Well, I kind of call it kind of instant gratification gardening. Seeds take time. Um, I've tried growing them indoors and planting them outside if I can manage that, like on a windowsill or something. I tend to go more for the seedlings, though. Um, I like to get things out there, get them established, get them planted, be done with it. I found that planting seeds outside is fine, but either they get washed away or they get eaten. Birds come, you know, the birds will watch you plant them and then they'll come and eat them. So seeds are a little bit tricky. Some things have to be done by seed, like root vegetables and stuff really have to be done by seed. Um, so I tend to go more for the plants and do only seeds when I have to do seeds. So, so um, you mentioned one reason to not grow tomatoes this year was the strange weather. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know in the last few years I've been here, it's kind of really been different almost every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how does that compare to the last uh, almost 20 years that you've been in D.C.? Well, uh, the weather was a little bit more predictable. Like, you, you expect the summer to be hot and humid. It's just that when it gets extremely rainy and wet, because the, at least, and this is nothing official, but my observation is the tomatoes do better when they get um, a good amount of heat and an and a, and a appropriate amount of water. But when it gets rainy and hot and humid, they just kind of swell up like a sponge and then they kind of burst and then they're kind of pointless. So it seems to be more that we get that type of weather as time has gone on and so the tomatoes just haven't, haven't done as well. And then also that kind of weather promotes, I think, probably some of the mildew that uh, uh, shows up on squash. You get a lot of mildew on squash leaves, cucumbers, stuff like that. Um, that humid, damp kind of weather when it doesn't dry out enough. Um, so I've seen that type of weather take its toll on some of these more standardized products um, or vegetables that we used to not have as much trouble with, at least as a home gardener. So, Have you ever uh, served like on the committee or the board? Mm -mm. Yeah. No, not with Melvin Hazen, no. Yeah. no. I knew I didn't have the time to volunteer, so I didn't. I didn't offer. So, do you, no. do you remember any like uh, mistakes you made? You know, here, you know, uh, that you just like, man, I can't believe I would have tried to grow something next to this. Or, um, well, no, not really. I was pretty realistic with what I did. Um, this year, and actually not this year, last year, 
Um, I started, um, no, it was this year. I started asparagus. Asparagus is a two-year minimum, and it's actually growing. So I'm going to give it a shot and see what happens. Um, I did try, like I mentioned earlier, like parsnips and carrots. For some reason, they just didn't, didn't, didn't work. Um, there's really been nothing, though, that I, I really thought would, would work. Well, the blueberries probably, I thought, should have gone a little better. But for the most part, no. Everything I've tried, I pretty much had realistic expectations with. Um, but there were no mistakes necessarily that I can think of that <clears throat> it's been so many years. It's okay. There's bound to be something that didn't go right that I probably did wrong. Um, technique probably more than other things like um, either planting seeds too deep or planting them too shallow or planting them right, not my fault, but planting them right before it rains and they wash away. I've had to replant the garden more than once just because of that. You know, you get it all cleaned up, you get it all seeded, you get it all set up, and then you get some torrential rain for the weekend and it just washes the whole thing away. Um, I've left things out too long sometimes, hoping they'll get a little bigger, a little riper. Off they go. Um, but, you know, no major blunders, just kind of a well mistakes kind of thing. So what, what, time of, what type, type of day gardener are you? In the mornings, weekend gardener? Weekend, weekend, yeah. It has to be the weekends for me, for the most part, yeah. Um, we have an inspection schedule in Melbourne Hazen, so it's kind of a random thing, but it's usually once a month. And I inevitably am always a week behind when they've done the inspection. Um, but... I pretty much stick to the weekends because that's the time when I can do it. Very rarely would I be able to do it in the evening after work or in the morning. Usually the weekend, yeah. And then you're limited, you know, if it's raining or if it's 105 out, it's like the last thing you want to do is go weed. So, but yeah, weekends for me. So have you, have you visited any of the other community gardens in the area? Or? I've just seen them. Yeah. I haven't gone through them, but I've seen a couple of them around. Not, not to explore them, really, just to know that there's a couple of them out there. Um, but I haven't really explored them at all. Just know that they're out there. Yeah. Um, so what type of... Uh, when your kitchen is working, <laughs> I mean, what, what type of dishes? I mean, it seems like you know what you grow you prepare the things mm -hmm. different ways or is there specialties that you have or just what do you usually make? I'm pretty holistic with and nutritious with my cooking so um, I don't do anything that's too elaborate and generally with squash um, you know it's boiled or something a little a steamed type of thing I've had really good luck with potatoes the last couple of years, which surprised some people, including myself. They were really good and they really worked. Um, and so, not for baking, but for mashed potatoes or putting into soups or stews or something like that. Um, Swiss chard, spinach, um, just braise them, a I mean, uh, saute them a little bit with some garlic or something like that, keep them pretty light, to keep them fresh. Um, lettuce, you know, just salads and stuff like this. Um, cucumbers, raw, nothing special there. Eggplant, when I've got an eggplant, then I'll either do a fry, an Italian fried eggplant and do um, Parmesan with it or ratatouille with it or something along that line. Tomatoes, when tomatoes, now there, t there were years when tomatoes were good. You know, some years worked, some years didn't. So when there was an abundance of tomatoes, ratatouille was, a, was always good to do with them, but primarily to salads or with some mozzarella basil, you know, you could do pretty good if you got all the pieces going right. Um, oh, um, beets, now again, beets, some years are good, some years not. I like to roast them, make a salad out of them. Um, um, lots of lots of herbs, and so you you know you include them in everything basically. Uh, cabbage, I had real good luck with cabbage, 
and there's a family meal, a, a boiled dinner we call it, but it's with sausage and potatoes and carrots and onions and things like that, and you just slice cabbage up into it, coleslaw, um, um, cauliflower, broccoli, you know, normal stuff, nothing too elaborate. I try to keep them healthy and fresh and so too special. <clears throat> When you when you came to Melvin Hazen, was how much how connected would would you say the the gardeners were? Did, do people really know each other, or did they kind of keep to themselves? Kind of kept to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there, just depends. I mean, where I am, the people around me, there's been a rotation, really only in one plot. Everyone else around me has been the same people pretty much for the whole time I've been there. Um, and I know the people that are around me, um, but you know, we may see each other every once every six weeks or something like that, and we may be just coming and going, passing. Everyone's schedule seems to be very different. So um, you, know, you, do, you do get to know the people after a while, but um, very seldom are you ever out there for any, any extended length of time with the same people. So. Uh, we know each other by name and by face, but that's about it. Yeah. yeah. So most people do kind of keep to themselves. Um, who Who are some of the, the the top the top gardeners out in Melvin Hazen right now? Would you consider yourself one of the most more successful gardeners? Or no, I wouldn't. Um, I mean, I do all right. Some years are better than others. There are people that um, excel really well. Um, um, the person that has her garden next to me, hers always looks amazing, and she's always out there taking care of it. Um, I would consider her one of the one of the more successful. Which side of next, um, next to your plot? Well, my plot to the right of my plot. If you're looking out on Sedgwick Street, mm -hmm. so the the plot closest to Connecticut Avenue, going down, um, and she's been there. Gosh, I don't know how many years prior to me. The um, you interviewed one of the other ladies. I forget. Her Jerry name. said. It. Yeah, Jerry. Yeah, mm -hmm. she has an amazing garden as well, and she's always out there taking care of it. So I know she does a really good job with hers. Mm -hmm. um, those would be the two people that come to mind. Yeah. There's a couple of others that you know they have really nice gardens and they take really good care of them. Um, I don't know how many plots are out there, but I would say. Of all the plots, there's probably a handful that are really successful. And I don't know if it has anything to do with anything, to be honest, because everyone's out there trying, you know, and some things work and some things don't. But some people just ha seem to have more of a green thumb than others, so. Have you, have you noticed any, like, increase in, like, the amount of rules and things over the, the time period you've been there? Or no. Has things been the same? It's been the same ever since I've been there. Yeah, I haven't noticed anything different. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. It's been the same, yeah. And uh, I mean, do you do you think they're all pretty? They're pretty much. I mean, it's pretty fair in terms mm -hmm. of. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, it's it's very logical, very basic. You know, um, they have the rules. They have the program with the inspections. You follow the rules, you're great. Um, if you ignore the rules, then you lose your plot. And they remind you there's 200 people on the waiting list so if you don't want to take care of it there's somebody out there who does so yeah, that's a big number right? it's a large number yeah yeah and it's always been that big always has been that big i'm really surprised that there's that many people that are interested in doing it um, but i think what happens too is a lot of people want to they don't realize what it takes and then they get into it um, but surprisingly in melvin hayes and the turnover is relatively small so people stick with it so, so f for you, uh, what, other than like, I'm sure time, enough time is probably a big challenge for mm -hmm. everyone. Is, is there anything that like really stands out as like a major challenge as an urban gardener? Or is, is well, to me, the biggest challenge is kind of twofold, is staying on top of it because of the rules. Now, there's not a lot of them, but you've got to stay on top of it. If it were my backyard, I could let it go a little bit differently. I could, you know, I could plan to garden only half of it or the whole thing or whatever. Um, however, because there are guidelines that have to be maintained, you have to stay on top of it a little more 
um, diligently than if it were your own to manage. Um, so for me, time is a real time is is really a challenge, and with the weather and other commitments, you spend a lot of time maintaining and weeding, very little time harvesting. So, <laughs> so you got to really just prepare yourself for the maintenance of it all, but to avoid getting the citations for not weeding and not doing this out of the other thing. If you get cited three times for the same thing and you don't address it, then you lose your plot. So unless there's some extenuating circumstance. So, you know, you know the inspection's going to come and you better be on top of it or you're going to get a citation. So um, me staying on top of it fast enough to avoid missing one of those deadlines is probably my biggest challenge. Because you don't always have every weekend free to go out there and do, do the maintenance. It would be nice if you had the time to say, yep, every Saturday morning from 8 to 10, I'm going to go out there and weed. Uh, life doesn't work that way, so it's just a little hard. So, um, in terms of you know new gardeners uh, coming into the area, I mean, there's an increase in people and number of gardens, people that are gardening in community gardens. What what sort of advice? I mean, you gave a little bit of advice here. Did you do you have any other tricks or tips that people you know that maybe not may not know anything about gardening, but really want to get into having a community garden? Well, my biggest, I think, that my biggest suggestion would be. Um, to be realistic with what you what you can manage because um, certain types of vegetables require a lot more maintenance than others. I mentioned potatoes earlier. Potatoes are like foolproof. You plant them, they grow all season, and when they're mature, you dig them up. That's the end of the story. Um, now there are different parts about potatoes that you need to know, but basically once you plant them, they go the whole season and you dig them up. Um, they don't require any maintenance whatsoever. They have to be planted properly so that they grow properly. Um, as opposed to, say, like a tomato plant, which is a lot more delicate, requires staking, it requires weeding, the right amount of water, uh, the right kind of soil, boom, 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 and you may get nothing out of them. And then they're also susceptible to so many, you know, exterior... Um, predators, bugs and birds and things like this. So just be realistic in what you plant and know what it takes to manage that because you could get in way over your head really fast. Um, and then, you know, you just waste a lot of time and money because, you know, you can't, can't maintain it. Um, so you got to be realistic with what you plant. Know what you're getting into, know how to maintain it, know how to grow it properly. And um, I think the second thing I would say is plan to harvest. That's a big deal because a lot of people don't harvest. You know, they get all gung-ho and they get all started and they produce really nice stuff, but they never pick any of it, which to me is a shame. So be realistic and plan to, to see it through to the end. Oh, was, is there anything else, you know, that, any information that I didn't, didn't get out of you that you think is... Um, any any other memories of any any good memories from the garden or well there have been some really good I mean it's really rewarding when you have a real good year you know when things really work but you can't let it get you down when the year doesn't work quite so well so um, I can remember some real like month after month you know you come in with bags full of stuff and then like <clears throat> um, last year was kind of a bummer year. Things didn't grow right. Things didn't survive. Things died. You know, it just was kind of one of those years. Um, I, I, the best memories I have are when things really were successful and really able to come home with something sustainable. You know, it's like, wow, there was enough out there to actually make something with. You know, uh, a bag full of beans or, you know, a dozen of whatever. Um, those are the best memories, is just when things really actually grow right. Um, and you get through the year without a citation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, that would be it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, I want to thank you for sure. making some time to come and yeah, thank visit you. us. And uh, thank you for everyone that was listening. Sure. Thank you.